George III. I hold this big book in my hand, The Last King of America, The Misunderstood Reign of George III, and I welcome Andrew Roberts, its author, back. Hello, Andrew. Welcome back. Merry Christmas. Hi. Merry Christmas, Hugh. Thanks very much for having me back on the show. Well, the first interview I had, I listened to the book, and I took notes when I had to from the book, but I just finished listening to it this week, and I had to get you back because it's just magnificent. And I want people to understand everything they think they know about George III is at least incomplete, perhaps not wrong, but at least incomplete. And there's a lot, particularly after the Revolutionary War is over, that I did not know at all. So this is, this is really quite an accomplishment. Is it doing well in England? Is it doing well in the United States? Yes, at the moment it's doing very well um, in both countries. I mean, obviously it's Christmas time, so people are buying books for, for friends and family. So one would hope that it would be doing well at this uh, week, but, but it's been doing very well indeed. Thank you. I can tell people it will be delivered if you go to Amazon.com right now. It will get there. And uh, I give away audiobooks because I, I want people to listen to this. But I'm going to plumb a couple of areas of this book that many people may not be familiar with, but which they will understand if they don't. And believe it or not, I'm going to begin with the East India Company, Andrew, because what I learned about George III in the East India crisis and about Charles Fox and about William Pitt and about Edmund Burke was a revelation to me. He is a British constitutionalist above all. And so I'm giving you a hard task to explain what the East India Company is, what Fox attempted to do, and why it is maybe the supreme crisis of his monarchy, and he came through it like a rock. Um, well, I think the supreme crisis of his monarchy has to be the American Revolution, the American War of Independence, but you're right, the supreme domestic political crisis undoubtedly was the East India one, where the East India Company, which was formed in the reign of, founded in the reign of Elizabeth I in 1600, had, by the time of his reign, essentially become the most powerful company um, in the world. It, it ran India, essentially, and, uh, or at least those parts of India that the, uh, that the East India Company uh, completely dominated, um, Bengal primarily. And, uh, and so it was incredibly rich, although occasionally it, it um, neared bankruptcy, but uh, overall it was, it was fabulously rich. And the Whig Party under Charles James Fox essentially threatened to nationalize it in 1783. And, um, and the king did his only unconstitutional act of his whole reign in, uh, in dismissing that government. Uh, and, and in doing so, he did it because the argument arose that the East India Company under the Fox Bill would become a new aristocracy, a new power under the British Constitution. And while they did indeed use George's name in the Lords, which is the unconstitutional act I think you referred to, uh, it was necessary to save the Constitution. It's a little bit Lincoln-like, in my view, that he, he bent the Constitution to save it, the British Constitution, not our Constitution. That's right. No, exactly. I mean, he also appointed the 24-year-old William Pitt the Younger when William Pitt did not have a majority in the House of Commons. And that is, was also considered a sort of constitutional coup by the, um, by the Whig historians. But I don't see it as such because uh, there was a general election only a couple of months later, and William Pitt the Younger won it in a landslide victory, which I think completely vindicates uh, George's actions. I think you call the election of 1784 the most dramatic election in the 18th century. And I love, I don't remember who said it. Again, when you listen to a book as opposed to read it, I can't take the same kind of notes. But someone referred to the Pitt administration as the mince pie administration. Would you explain that? It's appropriate to Christmas. Yes, yes. It was a, it was a joke that was leveled against the Pitt administration, which came in on the 19th of December, uh, 1783, and um, it was nicknamed the Minced Pie Administration because they said that it wasn't going to last any longer than the Christmas Mince Pies, i.e. it was only going to stay in for a few days. In fact, it stayed in power for 17 years. 17 years that included the French Revolution, the rise of despotism, and the opposition to Napoleon. Pitt the Younger, this is one of the advantages of the last king of America. It's supposedly about George III, and it is, but it's also about Pitt the Younger, and it's also about Charles Fox. I, I, one of the things I have changed is my opinion of Charles Fox, about whom I had thought well uh, that he was a necessary uh, 
impediment to George III. He's a rogue. And there's a bit of Trump in Charles Fox, don't you think? <laughs> well, he certainly kicked over the traces and didn't didn't abide by by the by the uh, rules of, uh, of politics, certainly. And he was also extremely rude, like Mr. Trump can be about his opponents. In fact, yes. He called- he called um, George III Satan uh, behind uh, George III's back, which uh, is something that I think even Mr. Um, Mr. Trump might not do in a presidential election. Well, don't put it past him, uh, uh, Andrew. <laughs> Let me go to what I have now discerned as the Andrew Roberts Project. And I didn't figure this out until the end of this, and I hope I'm right. You began with Salisbury, which is a magnificent book. You have written about Napoleon. Now you've written about George and Pitt. Uh, you have written about Churchill, and you're going to fill in the missing link with Disraeli. You will basically go from pre-modern Britain to modern Britain by the end of the Disraeli book, though not in sequence. You're assisted along the way by the release of new papers like Elizabeth's uh, access and of 100,000 pages of George. Was that the project from the beginning? What from the beginning of my time as a historian thirty years ago? Yes. No, no. I wish it. I wish it were. I, I'd love to have been able to have had that kind of prescience about one's own career. No, it was just pure luck, really. I've, I've sort of staggered from book to book. I hope one day, also, now that you've mentioned all those great, uh, great Tory uh, premiers and leaders, to do a biography of Margaret Thatcher um, before you know before the end. Oh, that would be very welcome because she is, well to me. I want people to know that at the end of this, I was surprised to hear you say in the same breath that George III is certainly ranked with the Georges of the 20th century and Elizabeth among the great monarchs of England and Victoria, the great monarchs of English history. Of course. I mean, he was responsible or in part responsible for, and certainly it was was during his reign that Britain suffered the greatest uh, strategic catastrophe in America, really the greatest strategic catastrophe between the loss of the Angevin lands in the 15th century and the fall of France in 1940. So, you know, it wasn't, um, it wasn't all uh, good news, but the, the Seven Years' War and the Napoleonic Wars were, were tremendous victories. Uh, can, can I push you to explain to an American audience what the glorious revolution of 1688, the Whig and the Tory parties represent when George takes the throne? Because I found... You know, I did stop occasionally on my walks and I wrote down different things. And I wrote down what he said about his number one job, which was he was doing to keep the oath that brought his family to the monarchy. He was to preserve the British Constitution as it existed in 1688 when his family was invited to mount the throne. I can't find it. But what was he talking about, Andrew? He was talking about limited monarchy. Um Prior to the 1688 revolution, there were the Stuart absolutists. They believed in the divine right of kings. They didn't really believe in uh, Parliament's uh, right to, uh, to be sovereign. And um, they thought of themselves as essentially despots, dictators, um, people who had the right to, to rule. And, um, and that was all dis- destroyed and thrown away and uh, uh, overthrown, should I say, in the 1688 glorious revolution. And it brought, as you say the Hanoverians, uh, via another couple of, uh, of kings immediately, but nonetheless, it was basically the Hanoverians were there because they were Protestants, because they believed in the Constitution, the new Constitution, and because they were limited um, monarchists, i.e. they, they recognized Parliament's uh, overwhelming right to rule the country rather than them. And he preserved that. He did not, uh, it, what's interesting to me, except for that, act in dismissing Fox and the banding about of his name during the East India Bill controversy, he never overreached his limited monarchical, and he never vetoed a bill of Parliament. That's right. He had the right to, but he never did, because he understood this, uh, this nature. He revered the Constitution of 1688, and he saw it as his primary duty as monarch to protect that Constitution. Now, among the many things, and we'll get into this in the second segment, I want to talk about his suffering in the second segment. In the third segment, we'll just go wherever we want to go. I want to remind people, you can order The Last King of America at Amazon.com right now. Whoever gets it will thank you for it when they've read it. They will thank you, thank you, thank you for it. He is a man of culture and learning. 
He did not travel. He did not go to your beloved Cambridge, Andrew, as I've never been to your beloved Cambridge. I'm not going to make that mistake again and compare Cambridge to Oxford. But do you hold it against him that he managed to get to Oxford but not to Cambridge? Yes, yes. It's extraordinary, <laughs> really, considering how beautiful Cambridge is. <laughs> and also because of the architecture. You see, he loved architecture. He was a, he was a prime supporter of the neoclassical movement of Georgian architecture, of which we have so many great examples at Cambridge. But then he never really went north of Worcester. He never went west of Plymouth. He, he didn't believe it, that he needed personally to travel anywhere. He had a collection of 40,000 topographical maps, and he, and he sort of um, gained his, uh, his, answered his curiosity by looking at them. He started the Royal Academy. He loved Hayden. He loved music. He's one of the most cultured, well-read, remarkable intellects in a monarch that I've come across. In fact, I'm hard-pressed to think of a monarch, maybe uh, Peter the Great, who worked so hard to be so well-informed about the world. Even if he screwed up American, we'll come back to that in the third segment. Uh, do you have a parallel? Not really. I suppose Frederick the Great is another possibility. Um, but, uh, no, his interest in, in as you say, uh, music and architecture and science and, uh, and astronomy, um, his collection of 80,000 books of his li in his library, his extraordinary art collection in the Royal Collection, about half of the paintings in the Royal Collection today, which is the largest private art collection in the world, um, were, were, were chosen by him. And what I, uh, by the way, you, you also acknowledge his son, George IV, the dissolute, who comes through really not very well in this book, um, may have had better taste, but George III paid his artists. I, I salute <laughs> you for noting that. <laughs> I know there's a lot of difference between having wonderful artistic taste and the taxpayer picking up the tab and having <laughs> very, very good artistic taste and you actually paying for it yourself. Oh, he was so abstemious. Uh, we'll come back. There's so much to learn about Andrew Roberts' book, The Last King of America. Stand by. I'll talk more with Andrew after the break. Maybe we'll come back with some Hayden in honor of of uh, his love of Hayden. Don't forget, this show depends upon sponsors like relieffactor.com. I get to have conversations with Andrew Roberts because of people like relieffactor.com. It's a great Christmas present as well as The Last King of America. And it will, for people who do what I do, which is listen to books when you're walking, uh, it, it allows you to take the long walks that you need and will want to take. That's the important part about a great book is you cannot wait to get back to it. You push aside other duties. You push aside everything, and you walk and walk and walk and walk while listening. That's what I did with The Last King of America. ReliefFactor.com makes that possible. Get rid of those minor aches and pains that come with exercise and aging, and come right back for more of Andrew Roberts. Go over to Amazon.com. Order The Last King of America, Andrew Roberts, and you will be a hero to whoever gets it, and they will just say, thank you, thank you, thank you, even though some Americans might have some arguments with Andrew Roberts. We'll get into that in segment three that will be available on the podcast later today. Stay tuned. One of the things that has been changed, welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt, live inside the Beltway, talking with historian Andrew Roberts about his wonderful new book, The Last King of America, The Misunderstood of Reign of George III. At Amazon right now, it is number one in historical British biographies. It's number one in royalty biographies. It's number one in American Revolution biographies. Boy, I would love to entertain you and Rick Atkinson at the same time, uh, whose book I read earlier this year at the recommendation of George W. Bush, The British Are Coming, and whom I, sp I heard give a eulogy for Fred Hyatt this week, uh, is one of his dear friends. And Rick Atkinson writes beautifully and uh, about the American Revolution. You write comprehensively and beautifully about it. But I'm gonna tell you my favorite anecdote in the whole book, uh, Andrew which is he gets into an argument, George III does, with William Pitt over who ought to be the Archbishop of Canterbury. And Pitt tries to, I think your word is bounce him on Catholic emancipation. He tried to bounce him on the Archbishop of Canterbury and promote Pitt's private secretary. Pitt got, uh, uh, George got very angry. So he got on his horse and he rode over to the house of Manor Sutton and he says to him, my Lord Archbishop of Canterbury, I wish you joy. Not a word. Go back to your guests. I hope I quoted that right. I love the yeah. way that he flanked Pitt, and I love the way that he told Manor Sutton, and I love that history proved him right. Manor Sutton was a lot better than the political guy. Uh, George was serious about his faith, and he put in a serious archbishop. 
And he also knew that William Pitt the Younger was essentially agnostic. And so he thought it was outrageous that he should want for uh, political purposes to appoint somebody to a, uh, to a spiritual role. My, my bishops shall be party men and politicians if private secretaries end up as bishops. I hope I got that right again. When you quote things, when you write things on your phone, it gets a little bit wrong. Uh, now to his faith. He's a stoic Christian. He knows he is descending. I, I regret the, the play. It mocks his madness. His madness is horrible. It's awful. Yeah. It's bipolar disorder. His, his five bouts of it are terrible. He walks into four of them knowing what he's going into. His faith endured. He suffered. It's, he's really a noble man. Yes, he asked. God to kill him at one point, doesn't he? Uh, goes down on his knees and uh, and begs him for uh, to be to be to be killed rather than to have to go carry on going through this uh, monstrous uh, manic depression that he was uh, he was struggling with so badly. When when did Fanny Burney's diaries, of which I was unaware, I know they've been out there. You quote from them extensively, as any good historian will. She provides the counterpoint to the madness. She provides this intimate look at a wonderful human being. That's right, yes. Um, <clears throat> they were published in the 1920s uh, when they were, they were discovered, you know, 150 years or so after they were written. She was a novelist, and so she's able to, uh, to make the... Um, although, of course, she's quoting directly and verbatim what the king is saying... Nonetheless, um, her powers of description are uh, tremendously impressive. And so she does bring to life that uh, Georgian court, which was sometimes stultifying. You'll remember the piece where she isn't allowed to cough. Yes. Um, and has to stand there, you know, preventing herself from coughing. Um, sometimes it was, it was pretty hard work being a courtier. But overall, they did, the people who knew George III best uh, loved him most. From his, uh, that's a profound thing to say, by the way. From his last descent in the madness in 1809 through his death in 1820, uh, how did you get the details of the long white beard? He's blind and he's deaf. He plays the harpsichord. He is rarely wild, but he is, he's mad. How, are those in the new details that have been released by the Queen? Um, no, those are in the doctor's reports that, um, that were made to Parliament at the, um, at the time. The doctors, every January, had to make a report of the king's, of what, the, what was happening with the king. Um, and so you can, you can read those in the House of Lords and the House of Commons um, committee reports. And uh, they, make, they make very um, uh, sort of pathos-laden uh, re reading, really, poor man. He, not only, uh, as you say, was he, was he blind and deaf, he was also senile and, and mad. It's, it's a terrible burden. And his family did not visit him. Uh, I think Charlotte went once. And the hammer blows. He lost his favorite daughter. He lost his favorite son. One son betrayed him. His father died young. Uh, I'm going to come back in the, uh, in the longer bit after this break and talk about what he got wrong about America, what he got right about America. But uh, Churchill suffered a lot, too. Uh, but I don't know of any monarch who suffered this much and endured in his faith. Do you, Andrew Roberts? No, and it never, and he never questioned um, his, well, he questioned his faith as everybody does, but he didn't... Um, uh, it didn't you know, defeat him. Uh, he, he continued um, being a, uh, a pious and believing Christian um, all the way through his life. And he was an opponent of Catholic emancipation. I'm going to talk with that in the interview with Hugh Hewitt, because I think it explains a lot of the American Revolution, actually. And uh, actually, we're going to have a talk about constitutional law and the American Revolution with Andrew Roberts, which will be available later today at the interview with Hugh Hewitt. Go to Amazon.com and order this book right now. It will arrive in time for Christmas. The Last King of America by Andrew Roberts. I'll be right back. The longer conversation with Andrew continues after this. I'm joined again by Andrew Roberts talking about his magnificent book, The Last King of America. And you are very patient with me, Andrew. I hope you're getting attention in America. You have a contrarian view of the revolution, and therefore I wonder if some Americans aren't willing to talk to you about that. Well, do you know, funny enough, um, I've had um, much more uh, polite and good-natured uh, discussions at places like Mount Vernon and uh, Monticello, 
um, than I've had in England. Um, so oh. uh, Americans have been have been very. There hasn't been any kind of uh, of uh, jingoism at all uh, so far in my discussions in America over this book. I would love to have you sit down with Dr. Arne at Hillsdale College for a long conversation about the Declaration. Uh, for yes, I think... Well, Larry's a great friend, in fact, right. and so I'd love to do that too. And also, I know Rick well as well. So, so uh, the prospect of uh, talking to both of them about this book is something that I relish, in fact. Uh, well, uh, I will let readers decide for themselves uh, your critique of the Declaration. I want to go to my particular view of the, irrever the irrevocable split that was coming, because Madison, who is the great architect of the American Republic, Jefferson, it's great propagandist and Hamilton, its great financier, they all agreed that religion should have nothing to do with governance. And George is a Protestant king who believes that the Reformation theology of Henry VIII is embodied in the revolution of 1688, rules out Catholic emancipation, and he fights Pitt over this constantly. It may have triggered his last lunacy, as you discuss in The Last King of America. Doesn't the American view, the Madisonian view of religion, oblige the, the nations to separate? Um, gosh, that's a very interesting uh, thing. I hadn't really thought about it in those terms. But yes, ultimately, of course, uh, the, um, you have in Britain, you still have today in Britain, a uh, established uh, church, um, you know, the Church of England as by law established, as it says in the Coronation Oath, uh, which allows 26 bishops to sit in the House of Lords, our you know, senior house of our legislature. And so um, that is completely different from the American Constitution, where, as you say, you've, you've essentially sort of forced God out of the picture completely. Uh, free exercise protected. The, the Madison biography by Lynn Shaney, I don't know if you ever had a chance to read it. I have read it, yes. It's a very good book, I thought. Fair, it should have won the American History Book, but for politics. Uh, she diagnosed by with a his mental not his mental illness his physical illness epilepsy, and traces his love of religious freedom to the to the freedom of guilt from being thought a sinner because of a physical ailment. Did any of the Protestants of the time think that George was smitten because of sin? Um, well, no, they thought that he not personal sin because of course he was very uxorious and he was the only one of the Hanoverians to love his wife and never take a mistress and so on. So they knew that it wasn't a personal sin, but they did uh, wonder, some of them, uh, whether or not it was the sin of the nation, uh, you know, the people's sin that was uh, being visited uh, on, um, on the king because of the rest of the nation being so sinful. When his jubilee came about, and you point out he invented the jubilee business, good for him. He's done many merchants in Great Britain a great deal of good. <laughs> uh, he was beloved. And, and I came to realize, was he at war with France for 49 years? Uh, I mean, some ridiculous number of years of his reign, he was at war with France. That's right. Well, he started off, um, he inherited the Seven Years' War, of course. Uh, he became king uh, three years into that. And then after that, we, uh, of course, the, Amer the French declared war at the time of the American War of Independence, a few months after Saratoga. Um, and then we had the very long war between 1793 and 1815 um, against revolutionary France and, and um, Napoleonic France. So, yeah, pretty much the majority, much the majority of his reign was spent fighting the, the French. Now, the, the decision to send Wellington to Spain is originally resisted by George, which I did not know. And then he comes to embrace it. Did he come to believe in Fabian tactics at sea because of his defeat by George Washington using Fabian tactics? He may well have done, yes. I mean, he, um, he recognized that, that what Wellington was doing in the peninsula was the correct uh, strategy. Unfortunately, he went mad um, fairly soon after the Battle of Talavera, so he didn't see the great victories of uh, Wellington's at, uh, in, the, in the peninsula war, such as Salamanca and so on. But, um, but yes, he... He did. They, the whole British establishment tried to learn the lessons of the American um, War of Independence and our defeat there uh, with regard to recruitment and um, the promotion of officers um, on merit as opposed to just how rich they were, uh, and lots of other areas as well like that. The great insight that Americans need to take away from this is that if Lynn manuel Miranda redid Hamilton, 
He would make Lord North the villain. George III makes a great villain, and it's a wonderful bit, and you riff off of it at the end and the beginning of the book. But it wasn't George. It's North. North is just not made out to be a wartime prime minister, and Germain is, is not a very accomplished secretary of war. That's right. Um, and some of the uh, people earlier as well, uh, Lord Hillsborough and other people who had key roles in trying to deal with America, um, were either hardliners when they should have been softliners or vice versa. So all in all, um, and our generals were pretty terrible as well. I mean, I don't think the way in which Cornwallis got himself uh, trapped oh, on the York no. Peninsula, the way that Burgoyne came down too far from Canada, the way that Sir William Howe uh, went off to Pennsylvania rather than sticking to the original plan. I mean, uh, George III was let down by his ministers and his admirals and his generals. But he always had a very good estimate of his adversaries. Uh, contrast, Napoleon, who he called a mushroom emperor and his parvenu pretensions, with Washington, his assessment made to Rush, I believe, that he will be the greatest man in the world if he leaves power. And he treated John... I, I, I had this completely wrong, Andrew. I thought he was rude to Adams. Uh, is that? Do you run into that common mis, uh, misunderstanding? Yes, and there are an awful, awful lot of people who also think that he was rude to Jefferson as well, and there's no evidence for that beyond Jefferson's autobiography, which was written 40 years later and made lots of other factual errors uh, in the um, process of telling that story. And I don't believe he was rude to him either. I th he was tremendously gracious to uh, Adams in June 1785 when he met him, and he said, I'll be very frank with you, I was the last to consent to the separation, but the separation having been made and having become inevitable, I've always said, and I say now, that I will be the first to meet the friendship of the United States as an independent power. It, it, it's beautifully done how you did that. And now I want to talk about, um, if I could, the Whigs. Because if I didn't understand anything, I didn't understand the Whig oligarchy and how Pitt is a new Whig, Fox is an old Whig, and if you don't get what George did in moving the British Constitution towards a prime minister and tossing the Whigs out, you don't really, as an American, you're not going to understand his central role in British history. That's a, a big order on your plate, Andrew. But could you explain that? Well, that's exactly right. Um, and, and Pitt, although being an, a, um, a new Whig, actually was the first of the Tories, of the, of the modern Tories. He founded the modern uh, Tory party, essentially, those, those around him as well as, as him. Uh, yes, the Whigs came to power at the time of the Glorious Revolution that we mentioned earlier, back in 1688, but the trouble is that they hung on to power for almost the entire 70-plus years before George III came to the, power, uh, to the throne, and one can see, in many ways, his whole reign as being one of trying to, to prize the, the fingers of the Whigs off the levers of power, partly by appointing Tories and independents and Scots and various other kind of people, uh, and partly by uh, encouraging um, splits within the Whig party between the, uh, the old core and the, and the new lot. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a, and there's a transition in the course of this where the cabinet used to have access to the king, and the king changed that, George changed that to the modern system that we have where there is a prime minister who kisses hands and basically communicates with the crown. Am I right? Yes, precisely. And that, that comes with William Pitt the Younger. Of course, it's helped um, enormously by the process of the king's, the king's malady, as it was called, his madness. Um, and during that period, the uh, politicians naturally became more powerful, especially the prime minister. But in the period before he was king, uh, each individual cabinet minister... Um, essentially reported to the king. But by the time he left the throne, um, they reported to the prime minister who himself reported to the king. Uh, this is a high compliment. Uh, I'm an old Nixon guy. I went to work for Nixon when I was 22, and I just laid down the presidency of Nixon. I wish Nixon had a biographer like you, Andrew, uh, because, number one, you could put to the... Uh, he didn't invent the enemies list. George III had an enemies list. <laughs> an absolute enemy of the king with serious business in the 18th century, and he's got one in his handwriting. Did you get to see that document? Oh, yes, absolutely. And you can see it, of course, because of all these papers that have been put online. Um, it's um, it's, it's a, a pretty serious list. If you were on that list, you could be absolutely certain that you would never get a, a peerage, you wouldn't get a knighthood, you wouldn't uh, 
become Lord Lieutenant of your county, you wouldn't become the honorary colonel of your regiment, and so on and so on and so on, and probably your cousins wouldn't either. So you would be quite strongly ostracized by your family. It was a very, very serious moment if you wanted to become the enemy of the king. I'm going to keep you 10 more minutes. I do have to hit a couple of my favorite points, and I stopped to write this down. The lust for stars and sashes, and also for enamel to hang around one's neck, has never been absent in British ranks, but it was particularly powerful in the 18th century when it was begged for from a king who had contempt for those who begged for it. Wow, Andrew, that takes... Uh, you have to put aside your hometown at attachments, right? <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. Well, I mean, yes, but it's, it's so true. You know, the people who, um, who he felt didn't deserve it were almost always the ones who insisted on it most loudly. And the people like the Duke of Grafton, who he thought did deserve it, never asked for the Order of the Garter at all. And so he, was, he took great pleasure in giving it to him as opposed to the people who were asking for it. He also invites incredibly smart people to court. He brings in Boswell, Johnson's biographer, and he leans in, how does Johnson know everything? And Boswell says to him, well, he doesn't finish the books. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah, there are, <laughs> there are lots of jokes in this book, aren't there? I, I, it was one of the fun things to, to write it, was to well, insert some of it. He's a very back. serious student of sermons, uh, and I love this quote, Voltaire is a monster, I own it fairly, similar to Rousseau. Uh, and, and I own it fairly. I love that stuff. And then uh, Edmund Burke, who is no friend of George, writes Reflections on the Revolution in France, which I had to learn as a freshman in, uh, in college. And he sees them at, a, and they're, they're not friends, but he sees them at one of his parties, Levy's, in, in 1791, and says, Read it. It will do you good. Do you good. Every gentleman should read it. It will do you good. Uh, you know, your narrator, whoever read this book, gets George down, his cadences, what, what, and all that. Perfectly. Oh, good. Oh, good. I didn't know that. That's, that's good to hear. Well, you see, um, of course, he had been an enemy of, uh, Burke had been an enemy of uh, King George's for 30 years. And then he sits down and writes this fabulous, fabulous work, Tory work, essentially, of, uh, of um, political philosophy. And, um, uh, and I, I, I've read it. Um, I love, in fact, I've got a first edition here in my library. I love oh. reflections. It's one of the most powerful um, works of political uh, theory and philosophy that I, I've ever read. And uh, I, it's wonderful that George III just threw away 30 years of enmity to, uh, to tell Burke how brilliant this, this new book has been. You see, that is the mark of a great mind. Uh, what, his reception of Adams, his compliment of Burke, the willingness to admit mistakes, which he did. I want to end... Andrew, on the fact that there was a book, The Wisdom of George III, which I would never have guessed. In it is contained his advice to his son Octavius. Economize amusement. Engage in seriousness and focus. Uh, would you expand on that? Because it, it really is wonderful advice from a father to a son. Yes, he gave lots of advice to his children, uh, none of whom took any of it, um, unfortunately for him, especially his eldest son, um, the, uh, the Prince Regent, who was a truly ghastly figure and a, 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 yes, he is. a, a person with almost no redeeming features whatsoever, in my view. Um, but, um, but he did write these, these carefully thought out uh, letters of um, recommendations of how to get, live the good life to his, uh, his children, f full of very good advice about, uh, about um, Everything really, you know, religion and uh, and uh, morals and all these themes. And uh, as I say, none of them um, bother to read them. If, even if they did read them, they certainly didn't live by them. Well, I come to the conclusion of of this again with a recommendation to people who are listening today: go out and order the Last King of America. He's a constitutionalist. It's the British Constitution. It's not our Constitution, but he's a constitutionalist and a man to be admired for whatever mistakes he made vis-a-vis -vis what you call them inevitable after the Seven Years' War. We simply were ready and we're not going to settle for less than independence. And that's probably true. I do think there's some structural uh, impediments to continued union with Great Britain. And I'm sorry it took as long as it did. But as you point out, wars often go on a lot longer than they need to. Uh, Andrew Roberts, congratulations. Uh, it, to get one such book out of a career is a great thing. You've got four and counting. I'm waiting on Disraeli. Are you at work? 
I'm just about to start as soon as, uh, as soon as Christmas is over. Thank you very much indeed. You. I appreciate <laughs> Thank it. you, Andrew. Happy, very Merry Christmas and The Last King of America available everywhere at Amazon.com. Go and get it. You will be thanked by the recipient.